this is what 50 years on the road will do to you. Just take a look at that. <laughs> all right, are we good? You can, you can hear us all? Um, anyway, it is great to be here. Meg, thank you so much for that introduction. You're absolutely right that um, we've had, we have a special fondness for Tucson um, for all kinds of reasons. But one reason is that there is so much good, interesting, unique food to eat here. Um, much of which we know about thanks to uh, Marsha and Ron Spark, who are sitting right there, who have clued us into a lot of great restaurants in this city. Uh, anyway, we started, uh, we're going we're to talk a little bit about where we've been and how we got through the last 40 years of traveling, and then we will do some Q&A. Uh, and if, while we're talking, you have any questions about these photos, we can answer them. I mean, they're kind of self-explanatory. Anyway, um, so we started, we hit the road about uh, a little over 40 years ago, right around the time. Um, actually, 50 years. Well, we hit it actually before CCP was founded, yes. I was saying that, that we began our, our, the first edition of Road Food was published in 1977. Um, and I turned 72 yesterday, and we started road fooding when I was 21. So we didn't know we were road fooding at the time. No. We were just eating. We were just playing hooky from college uh, and eating our way along the Connecticut coast and discovering, you know, fried clams, lobster rolls, uh, and New Haven's fantastic pizza. Um, and you know, we, as I said, we, we neither of us had any intention of writing about food or being professional travelers. Um, but uh, you know, we got these fantastic graduate degrees from Yale. And looked at each other and said, "Well, you know, what yeah. can we do? I, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a professional art historian, and Jane is a professional abstract expressionist artist. Um, neither of which is an instant ticket to to a good job. So, um, much to the dismay of our parents, who had recently paid for our highfalutin educations, we decided to hit the road. We had enjoyed exploring the Connecticut coastline so much. We thought, you know what? Let's do." Let's, well, you know, first, first we did the trucker book. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. The first, we, we've written 43 books, um, published 43 books. And um, the first one most people don't know about because it was, my, I, my name was on it. But then it said photos by Jane and Michael Stern. And what that book was, was um, a photo essay about the life of long haul truckers. And we spent three years going back and forth from truck stop to truck stop, taking pictures and, and interviews with truckers. When that book, and I'm only telling this story because we're sitting in this, in this grand, beautiful gallery. Um, when the book was published, I was invited, I was, because I was the author, invited on, and I do not remember the name of the show, but it was like PBS American, the greats of American photography. <laughs> and I went on, and I literally, they said, well, you know, the first question is about like, what, what F-stop did you use? I used a, an Instamatic for every picture I took in it. And I had n no idea what I was talking. I was just making it up as I went along. <laughs> Michael, on the other hand, legit legitimately has camera in his blood because he grew up in Winnetka, Illinois, and his father owned Stern's Camera and Sound Center. And so while I was using my Instamatic, Michael was awash. With I was toting around a Hasselblad and lenses and, you know. Right, Every, everything. I'm an equipment nerd. Right. But the, the reason that that's an important part of, of what we're talking about is when we started, I mean, obviously, we didn't invent writing about food. I mean, there were, you know, <laughs> many generations of great food writers before us. But food and photography was really not put together. There were recipe, recipe books. And except for the Time Life series 
that James Beard did, which had photographs, very, very few books had, had, had photographs in them. So our genre of, of restaurants is the little mom and pop out of the way place in Gnawbone, Indiana. You know, we, we're now writing about what's at the Ritz Carlton and there's a Ritz Carlton, isn't there in Tucson? I think. It's a good point. <laughs> okay, um, so we we started taking pictures of food. I cannot tell you. Well, I can tell you because I'm going to tell you how insane it seemed when we the places we were at, Mom's Diner in you know Pig Snout, Nebraska. You know, in the middle of nowhere. Here's Michael with his Hasselblad and lights like Cecil B. DeMille, you know. Taking a, a picture of a, of a chicken fried steak, you know. Right. <laughs> you know, and a half-eaten chicken fried steak. And people well, would look at us like we were completely crazy. And in fact, why would somebody want to take a picture of, of their food? And it got to the point where I <laughs> because I wasn't taking the photographs and it made me really uncomfortable and shy. I was always like lurking in the <laughs> restroom or something. People would come up to me and say, what's he doing? And, and I said, this happened to be in Topeka, Kansas, this, this particular place, which is where the Menninger Clinic is, which is a big psychiatric hospital. It just came into, I said, he was just released from the Menninger Clinic. <laughs> and he's harmless, but he's obsessed with taking pictures of like grilled cheese sandwiches. And all of a sudden, from being these lunatics, these sweet people in this restaurant, they, sir, would you, you like Here's my half-eaten muffin. Would you like right? to take a picture of that? <laughs> 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 but it, it, you know, it, the New Yorker ran a cartoon a couple of years ago, um, and the caption was, it was a waiter at it coming up to a table, and the waiter said, is there anything wrong with your food, sir? You're not taking a photo of it. <laughs> because now everybody's a critic. Everybody has a cell phone. And if you're not taking a picture of food, then... They think you escaped from Menninger Clinic. <laughs> well, anyway, we should, we should just sort of go back and, and say how the idea of road food came to be and sort of how we actually got on the road after doing this book about long-haul truckers. Can I just say something no. for one minute? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yesterday was my birthday. Freaking Delta Airlines oh, lost right. all my luggage. <laughs> and they still don't know where it is. They gave me $50 to buy a t-shirt at the hotel. <laughs> I had a really nice outfit to wear. I'm sorry, this is repulsive. And <laughs> it's from the gift shop of the Arizona Inn. So and Del it's Delta's fault. So if you think I look disgusting, write to Delta Airlines. OK. Go, go where ahead. was I? <laughs> I don't know. Road food. OK, yeah, I was going to go back and say how the idea of road food came to be. Because at first, we didn't know. At first, after doing the trucker book, we thought, well, let's. Uh, the, the trucker book actually came out at just the right time, just accidentally and fortuitously. Some of you in here are old enough to remember how in the mid-1970s, Truckers were suddenly big in the news. And it um, came out at the same time as pumping iron. Well, because yeah, that was a, another photo essay. Oh, but right. at the time, you know, gas prices had suddenly zoomed up. There was a trucker strike. Some of you may remember a song that was, on, that was number one for weeks called Convoy. Um, so truckers suddenly were news. And just, you know, luckily for us, that meant the book was very successful, meaning that our, you know, we had no intention of being writers whatsoever. But our editor said, well, OK, what's next? And we said, let's do a guide to truck stops, like where to eat, you know, because we had in fact eaten some good food in truck stops. But pretty soon we realized that there weren't that many good truck stops. Most truck stop food is actually pretty awful, despite the <laughs> reputation. And that, most of the truckers said, if I didn't have yeah. a semi, if I wasn't driving an 18-wheel semi, 
I'd go five miles down there and I'd eat at Joe's little kitchen. So we kept this book of all the, the truck stops and the places that we should have gone to. So, well, we quickly realized that it wasn't just stuff to eat that we were looking for, because as we traveled, we were really getting a sense of the character of the different regions of this country. And it soon dawned on us that what we were actually interested in finding was food that was unique to its place. I mean, cultural anthropology. Folks. Yeah, yeah, right. Cultural anthropology. But basically, food that expressed where you were. You know, so, you know, finding a great lobster roll in Maine or great tamales in Tucson, um, you know, was, it suddenly became our mission. So we said, OK, we, we kind of got full of ourselves. And, and, you know, we are going to document regional American food. Um, and that became our goal. I remember we were so full of ourselves. I remember we were in a, in a restaurant in southern Louisiana. And we sat down. And I had my notepad. And the waitress came up to us. It was a town cafe. And uh, she said, what do you have? And I said, well, do you serve regional American food here? Um, and she said, well, no, we just serve regular food. Um, and, you know, I don't have to tell you. I mean, in fact, what we had was, you know, fantastic gumbo, crawfish pie, and bread pudding with whiskey sauce for dessert. We had yeah. Michael ask the waitress that the vegetable was, was meat threes, as they call it. And she said, boiled okra. And I see Michael writing down bald okra, like, you know, hairless okra. <laughs> So we didn't even speak the lingo. Well, it dawned on us. I mean, that was one of the moments when it dawned on us that, in fact, what we were doing that's kind of different than what a lot of food writers have done is that we were not documenting the great chefs, you know, the extraordinary meals, necessarily. We were documenting regular food, um, you know, and regular food at its, at its most regionally specific. And if I can just take you back in a time capsule. I mean, this really, I do feel like we had a stegosaurus in the back seat of our car. I mean, this seems so far away. When we started doing our road food adventure, well, obviously there were no cell phones. There was no GPS. There was a Rand McNally map. Paper map. Paper map. There were no, literally no guidebooks on American food that wasn't taking you to the finest uh, Lutece or some incredibly expensive French restaurant in Chicago. There was no book about regional American food. So we got, now, I mean, yeah, we went to Yale, but we're still basically idiots and still are. But. Um, <laughs> OK, we had the Rand McNally. Do you guys remember the Rand McNally maps? There was like a, you know, you opened it up, and the um, United States was this big. And every state was a pretty color. Like Nebraska was pink, and Arizona was green. And you know, it looked like a place map. So Michael and I looked at it, and we said, oh my god. God, this is like going to take us like three weeks, you know. I mean, well, our goal, our, we, our, what we planned to do was to review all the restaurants in the country. Yeah, that was our that plan. Was, that was our thought. <laughs> right, because we were we'd never been at, at anywhere and knew nothing about anything, and for the first six months. Well, we started in New Haven, and Guilford. opened the uh, Guilford, Connecticut. We opened the Yellow Pages. To and, a. and went to the Acropolis Diner. That was our first restaurant. Right. And then, the Ace Truck Stop, the Andes, whatever. We hadn't even gotten through the A's in Guilford, Connecticut, before we realized <laughs> we had to the entire this, yeah. you know, United States. We had no idea what we were doing. We had no air conditioning in the car. There was no fast food, literally. I mean, maybe there was, there was a little one bit. McDonald's somewhere. But when you went into a small town, which was our meat and potatoes, meat and threes, um, there was a, a town square. There was a courthouse, police station, cafe. And there's a, usually only one cafe, maybe a, I don't know, Merle Norman makeup store. It was, you know, 
it was, they were little. And so we'd go to the cafe. We had no choice. And it was, it, it took us four years to write the book, but it was so easy because there was no choice. It was like, you go there, you know. In those days, Michael had his hair down to here, and I looked like I had just fallen off the back of a gypsy caravan. And so when we went into these like small southern towns, we were looked at without great welcoming arms. But as soon as you start talking to people, the, the first thing they thought we were bored of health. Well, with my camera and you know, taking notes, I, mean, right. I forget. Then they thought we were going to open Ma Mom and Pop's other cafe across the square. And when, when they realized we were harmless, they opened their arms. Well, and food is one of those things that very few people don't have an opinion about. And you know, as soon as people in a cafe would realize that we were interested, actually interested in the sour cream raisin pie they were eating in northern Wisconsin, they would say, well, if you like this, you have to try the, you know, sour cream raisin pie. <laughs> um, you have to try this other, you know, three, three cities down, take Route 38, and you're going to find a place that has the best apple, Dutch apple pie. You know, people, it would, it's, everybody, people are eager to sort of tell you their, fi everyone's an expert when it comes to food. I mean, everyone is a critic. If you've ever looked on Yelp, you'll know that's Right, Unfor true. that's one of the unfortunate results right. of that. Um, our publisher uh, was Knopf, and our editor was Judith Jones, who was James Beard, MFK Fisher, and Julia Child's editor. And Bob Gottlieb, who was the editor-in-chief, just loved our stuff. But Julia, I mean, um, yeah. Um, Judith. Judith, I'm sorry. Um, he gave her the manuscript or the, the, the plan for road food. And she said, I'd kill myself before I do a book on small town cafes in Nebraska. <laughs> so we, Bob became our editor. And we got, I think, for four years of crisscrossing the country, I think we got $4,000. Yeah. Was that our advance? And we thought we were like oh my God, stealing money in, for doing that. In dough. <laughs> So here's what we did. We went to Bob's crappy used car dealership in Guilford, Connecticut, where we lived. And we bought the world's ugly, I mean, it was like vomit green SUV. If you've seen, it, it, was, a, it was a Suburban, a big Chevrolet Suburban. If you've seen um, National Lampoon's Vacation, remember the family truckster? Yeah, it was it, very it much was like that. that. And our plan, because our plan was to drive, is, was to go to every restaurant in every city, in, in every state in America, that we were going to save money by living in the suburban. We were going to spend all day driving in the enough. suburban and then sleeping in the suburban. Now, neither of us ever have camped out ever <laughs> in our lives, you know. So the first thing we thought, okay, we'll soak, I'm going to sew curtains. I've never sewn in my life. I'm going to sew gingham <laughs> curtains around every window in the suburban, not thinking that it might be a good idea to be able to look out the window when we're driving. But we did them. And, and we got I, a couple of air mattresses that fit perfectly in the back if the seats were down. Right. So we and could like lie in there. For some reason, we bought Boy Scout those like I, like canteens and tins with the fork to yeah, cook I, like I hobos know. over a fire, you know. Right. I don't mean, know day. what the hell we thought we were doing. So our first, the first day we went, we drove. We we're very, very on the road. We drove him. We just wanted to get the hell out of Connecticut. I mean, that was like something. We drove to Washington. Uh, to D.C. The like, D.C. area, somewhere in the country, right. the Virginia countryside. And we saw a sign for Jellystone Park, which was like the mo logo was Fred and Wilma Flintstone, and they were camping out. And so this was, we, you know, we said, ah, this is where people who sleep in their car go. 
And of course, it's like all Winnebago's and these, you know, and we come Our in and it's like, rig. Yes. you know, shitty vomit green car with, you know, calico curtains. And nobody would talk to us. I mean, they, first of all, we had nothing to hook up. We had no gas, we had no toilet, we had no, so we just parked the car there. And do you remember what, trying to sleep? Yeah, well, I think it got dark around 7 o'clock. Yeah, so we, we lay down on our two mattresses next to each back, other. Staring on our back, at the It was like a, like a dual MRI machine. You know, there we were. Like, <laughs> right. And we were too scared to go to the bathroom. We were too scared to leave the car. That didn't work out so, so well. No, so um, that was the end. The next day, we went to a pawn shop, got rid of all the camping equipment. But do you remember how that car met its end? I do. So we were in the South. This was a Southern. That was a doomed car. Yeah, it, it was, it was our first like serious Southern road trip. And one of the things we discovered traveling around the South was something that neither of us was fully aware of, which is how important barbecue is in the South and how different it is from you know Western North Carolina to, to Eastern North Carolina and from Carolina to Alabama to Tennessee. It's you like know, Mexican food, Sonoran versus Oaxaca. I mean, barbecue versus, is. is you know, Every county has a, some unique twist on barbecue, but one of the things that is very different from barbecue to barbecue as you travel throughout the South is barbecue sauce. Um, and nowadays, most barbecue restaurants, or many barbecue restaurants, bottle their sauce and you can buy it if you like it. Everything is online. Yeah, you can get it online or buy it at the restaurant. Well, oh gosh. Lost my microphone. Um, I'll tell the story. No, you might. All right, I'll, I'll tell it till you get to Okay, the there I go. Oh, okay. Anyway, so one of the things we decided to do was to collect barbecue sauce as we traveled. But since most restaurants weren't ready and equipped to sell it to us, we would <laughs> That's we, an understatement. we collected okay. uh, any kind of you know empty jugs, bottles. Like this, we would fill with or this, you know, you know Kleenex uh, in it, to iced keep, tea bottle. To keep it in. At one time, we bought an entire like a gallon of sweet tea. I remember thinking, well, we'll drink the tea, and then um, we'll have a big jug to put when barbecue we're in Death sauce Valley, in. I remember that was our plan. Well, th yeah, but, but the problem is that we forgot about it in the back seat, and it leaked, and it, like really sweet tea infused the back rug, and right. once that starts to rot, weather. let me tell you. Uh, anyway, so what eventually happened is the back of that suburban, which is immense, eventually yeah, it, it was such a big car; it had two. Two air conditioners. air conditioners, and probably got one mile a it was, gallon. It, yeah, not gas. So, so that the back of that vehicle was pretty much filled with every jugs, jars, bottles full of barbecue sauce that we had collected throughout the Southland. We were so proud of ourselves, finally heading home with this like fabulous booty of barbecue sauce. And I remember we were driving right on the South to North Carolina border. It was right on the border. They had one of those guys with the the thing that's a stop. Stop. There was some construction you know. thing going on. And I remember we were playing an eight-track tape of Merle Haggard. And suddenly on the tape, I heard horns that I didn't remember being in the song. Uh, and I looked in the rearview mirror and realized they were not in the song. They were, in fact, in a, in a gravel truck that had lost its brakes and was bearing down on us and, and smashed, smashed into the back of our Suburban. Accordioned it. We were totally unhurt. But every barbecue jug. Well, it saved our lives, really, because it right. was like, it was a, like yeah. a huge barbecue airbag. Right. But when, when it exploded, and I mean the car just crumpled, it looked like there had been a mass casualty of like 15 airliners crashing on the, on the highway. Ambulances from North Carolina. South Carolina, every, I mean, it was, you know, and Michael is sitting like this, trying to get, get to some, lick the sauce some of off, the, off road. the ground and put it, put it back in here. So that car was gone. I'm just thinking, actually, we've had a, a few interesting mishaps with barbecue. I'm thinking, of the, remember the, the barbecue Wood? we got at the Ridgewood? Okay, can I tell yeah, you Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I love that story. I think, is that? Ah, there it is, the, Ridge, the yes. Ridgewood barbecue. In easternmost, in the mountains of easternmost Tennessee, way out of the way. In such a way out of the way, um, um, t t 
intergenerationally. Is that the word? Yeah. Um, close enough. I've been an EMT for 20 years, so I'm always ready to run into a burning building and save chickens and, you know, whatever. And this place was in such, like, really the sticks that we drove by a house that was fully engulfed in flames. And we ran in, and the people were running out, and we said, can we use your phone? And they said, we don't have phones around here. You know, so, this was before cell phones. So. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah. The anyway. house burned down. OK, anyway. so <laughs> we had written about this place, and People Magazine had asked, asked us to do a big article about what we thought was the best barbecue in America, which was much bigger than this. So we wrote about this place. And then it was a year later, two years later, we were looping through that part of the country. And Michael said, we just, you know, we've got to go say hello to Mrs. Grace Prophet, who is the, the lady who ran the place. Just say hi, give her a hug and say hi. Well, Southern hospitality, you don't go in to give somebody a hug and say bye. You, you go and give them a hug and they give you 50 pounds of barbecued ribs, you know, with all the, the side dishes and the, the, the trimmings. Now, we had spent all day in the car eating. Eating barbecue, basically. Eating, I mean, we, we used to eat. And we, first of all, our, our, we used to try and do th between three and 400 miles a day. And we would stop for breakfast, lunch, and dinner we would have six breakfasts, five lunches, and as ever many dinners as we could do. I mean, we really could, we never, we didn't have to finish everything, but we would order the whole menu, and Michael would photograph it, and we'd, we'd eat what we could. Anyway, so we went to, to the Ridgewood and left Mrs., it was like 10 o'clock at night, it was very Mrs. Late, Prophet. Yeah. With you've seen this big catering aluminum catering trays, you know, with the the tin foil over them, and we put them in the back of the car, and and we were scheduled to do the same kind of eating the next several days. So what are we going to do with you know all these right. ribs? And you know we were we just felt really guilty because it's like the best food in America, and we're going to like throw it away. So we were driving around, we were driving around. I, what, Roanoke? We finally got to Roanoke, to Roanoke, Virginia, yeah. And we're looking for dogs to give it to. There were no dogs, there were no, you know. So finally we get, it's like midnight in, in Roanoke, and we see railroad tracks and a railroad crossing. And we see about seven really shoddy looking guys standing around like a, a metal waste can that has a fire in it. You Seemingly know, like, warming their hands. Like the yeah. classic hobos won't warm, you know. And they're, you know, it's the railroad. So we had hobos. Oh, my God, this is, you know, a blessing. <laughs> so Michael pulls over, and we go out. <laughs> with our catering trays. <laughs> with our giant <laughs> catering trays of ribs. And as soon as, like, we got about as close as, as we are to each other, lights and sirens came on. It was a meth, meth dealer drop, and Michael and I were catering it. And the, the police had been staking this thing out for like two months, and we're walking in with, you know, cornbread, and, you know, it took a while to explain it, but... The, well, the police confiscated it, and so somebody got to eat it anyway. That's the happy ending to yeah. the story, right? <laughs> yeah. So we didn't we didn't necessarily have great barbecue. No. Look, the other time was remember they put you in that cage in the back of the. We were in the um, oh god I'm blind, the Hopi reservation. Yeah, actually not yes. The uh, when the when I was caught speeding and I was reminded that I was that the laws were not those of of Arizona or the United States. So, um, and it was like and 3 o'clock in the morning in the middle of, what, what did they call that? The, the second mesa or? Yeah. Right, and like nothing. I mean, there's nothing there. And 
we were in a car and had no idea where we were going. And they said, you have to go to the police station and pay the fine. So Michael gets back in the car. And they said, no, you can't, do, you can't ride in the car because we don't want you escaping. They had like a cage in the, in the back of the pickup truck. In the back truck. of a pickup a truck, which <laughs> he had to go to until he got to the tribal, the tribal. <laughs> we, the, we also we also had really crappy luck with Native Americans because oh, you mean our, <laughs> we were yes. at the yeah, Tuba yeah. City truck stop in Tuba City, Arizona. Yeah. Right and. We, no, it wasn't. It was a different one. It wasn't. It, it, it was for in the four corners, but I don't. It, it, it was on that. that it was trip. a small. Oh, it was called the Na Navajo Cafe. Yeah, the Navajo Cafe. And it was in Wins uh, Winslow. Somewhere along. I don't know where it was. Anyway, whatever. so. Um, and it really was frequented by Navajos. I remember the the, uh, the radio was on, and it was. It was in, in Navajo, every once in a while, like every couple of minutes, you hear all Navajo all the time. Right. And then they would go back to speaking and I don't Navajo. Know if, if any of you guys speak, <laughs> it took me three years to learn Yatahe, which right. means hello. That's, that's the extent. And as my <laughs> friend Marsha, who's sitting in the audience, and probably other than me, is the world's most fanatic about Native American jewelry and crafts. So whenever I'm in Navajo land, I'm like, you know, going out of my mind. So we were in, we were having Navajo tacos, and this like cute little old lady in a velvet squash thing with a squash blossom necklace comes up, and she said, "We're selling raffle tickets," and it, of course, in my mind, she was selling her necklace, you know. So I we took a couple of tickets, and you know, got the raffle tickets. We went back the next day for lunch, uh, for more Navajo tacos. And one of the, the owners of the cafe came running up to us and they said, you won, you won the lottery. And, you know, I'm thinking, I'm starting small with the squash blossom necklace and then maybe going to a Hogan and then maybe owning half of you know, Monument Valley. Okay, they said, sit here, we're gonna bring the grand prize in. They brought the biggest, stinkingest sheep um, on a leash with shit all over its rear end. This was not like a 4 H show sheep, but the Navajos like sheep and they make, use the wool and they eat the mutton. You know, so Michael and I, I think at that point we, we had made some money and we had a Mercedes. <laughs> right. I mean, we would go, you know, up and down. I mean, writers are either we're, we're in the money or we're totally broke. And we had this big black Mercedes part inside and the guys try to push the sheep into the, I mean, the sheep, the sheep must have been from where Michael's, Michael's arm is to here. And we said, you know, no, please let us give the sheep back to you and, you know, have the raffle again with our good So you wish. wound up winning nothing. So I wound up winning nothing, absolutely.